My name is Kyle Roberts, and I am the Assistant Professor of Public History and New Media here at Loyola. On behalf of my conference co-organizer, Steve, who just went behind that wall, <laughs> he will reappear on the other side, I hope, uh, I welcome you to the conference, Crossings and Dwellings, Restored Jesuits, Women Religious, American Experience, 1814 to 2014. The journey to this conference began 31 months ago in a conversation about how Loyola might make a contribution to the bicentennial of the restoration of the Jesuit order. And as that conversation progressed, and as we noted the paucity of scholarship, uh, on the, the paucity of scholarship on sort of the, uh, the Jesuits in the second half of the 19th century and the 20th century, we also noted the paucity of scholarship on the relation between the women religious and Jesuits throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. So we decided we're not going to just do one commemoration, we'll do two. And we are celebrating a century of women's education at Loyola University and Mundelein College. This conference and accompanying exhibition, which is downstairs, I hope you've had a chance to see it, uh, we'll also have a reception down there from 4 to 7 tomorrow night, if you haven't seen it, has already generated a number of intellectual, spiritual, and as some of you can attest, terrestrial crossings. Over the next three days, we hope we, we can dwell on the subject at hand, orienting ourselves to the work and sources available to us, building new observations and connections through our discussions, and finally, preparing to inhabit a vibrant, renewed field of scholarly endeavor. Thank you for joining us. Now, quick bit of housekeeping. Tomorrow's plenary starts at 9 a.m. and it's going to be in this room. Uh, we will have coffee and rolls, so if you're a light breakfast person, come join us. If you're a heavier breakfast person, uh, there are plenty of great places in the neighborhood to eat. It is now my pleasure to introduce our moderator for the evening, Janet Sizzler, director of the Gannon Center for Women in Leadership. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kyle. It is my pleasure this evening to introduce our opening speaker, Carol Colburn. Dr. Carol Colburn received her PhD from the University of Kansas in 1988, where she worked as a research assistant and teaching assistant in the Department of History, as well as teaching faculty in the Women's Studies Department. Coming to a, a, a via, via university in 1989, she has taught courses in education, history, psychology, religious studies, and women's studies. Dr. Colburn has published two books, Life at Four Corners, Religion, Gender, and Education in a German Lutheran Community, 1868 to 1945, and of particular importance to us this evening, Spirited Lives, How Nuns Shaped Catholic Culture and American Life, 1836 to 1920. Carol has made numerous scholarly presentations at national and international conferences in history and in religious studies. Besides publishing many articles in professional journals, she has also served as a consultant on a variety of books and film projects, including Mary Fishman's Band of Sisters and the PBS documentary Sisters of Selma, bearing witness for change. She also served as the histori historian consultant for Women in Spirit, a traveling exhibit sponsored by the Leadership Conference of Religious Women. Tonight, Carol will start off our conversation with her comments on crossing boundaries and cultural encounters, women religious and as builders and shapers of Catholic culture and American life. Carol, welcome. I want to thank uh, Loyola University and the Gannon Center for Women in Leadership and its director, uh, Janet Sisler. This is a real opportunity for me um, to be at this, at this wonderful conference commemorating the 200th anniversary of the Jesuit Restoration. I've been to a number of Jesuit universities, but for the most part, I've spent time in your archives, um, and they are wonderful. Uh, and so my, my main connection is there. I am not a historian of, of Jesuit history, 
but I see that many scholars are on the program and we will have many, many opportunities. I was invited for a different reason. I'm here to provide another perspective, another story, one that indeed crosses boundaries and at times dwellings with American Jesuit history, but it has its own historical and cultural trajectory. This is the story of the women religious who came to this country over 200 years ago and created a parallel but powerful narrative of adaptation and survival amid physical uh, deprivations, anti-Catholic hostility, immigrant tensions, and cultural encounters with a plethora of peoples and cultures that became our nation. I confess that trying to cover 200 years is ridiculous, um, but I'm going to give you a whirlwind tour, and I'm going to do it where I try to focus on themes and particular events that are pivotal within the history of Catholic Sisters, sort of a part one in terms of starting in, in, in the early 1800s, going to the early 1900s, and then finishing from there to the, the present. So, so hang with me, I want to want to pack a lot, a lot into this. My intent really here is to create, discuss, analyze the larger context. My responders are going to be very helpful, particularly in terms of putting it into some specifics and, and about the, 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 the experience of Catholic sisters. So I'm the, I'm the big picture person, and then they will fill in the things that I have forgotten or things that, that they can relate to in terms of their own research. And I, I think maybe throughout the conference, some of these themes I'm hoping will be revisited, and we'll see these overlaps, and we'll see these connections as well as that, that larger piece. After the initial Ursuline Foundation in New Orleans in 1727, the early to mid-century saw the expansion of women's communities, some homegrown, but many from Europe. Congregations like the Society of the Sacred Heart, the Sisters of Charity, Sisters of St. Joseph, the Sisters of Mercy, Sisters of Loretto, um, who are one of the few that, be, that began here, Sisters of Charity of the, uh, uh, of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Many, that's just a, a type, just touching on the number of, of communities that were here prior to the Civil War. Midwestern cities like Chicago, St. Louis, Milwaukee, Cincinnati, Davenport, St. Paul, among others, boasted multiple Catholic women's communities. By the end of the 19th century, there was approximately 46,000 Catholic sisters in the United States. The expansion of Catholic culture and identity and its subsequent influence in American society could not have occurred without the labor and activities of these women. It boggles the contemporary mind. Let me just, let me give you just a, a few numbers here. By 1920, 90,000 Catholic sisters had created and are maintained approximately 500 hospitals, 50 women's colleges, and over 6,000 parochial schools serving at that point 1.7 million school children in every region of the country, urban and rural. These figures do not include the vast numbers of orphanages, private academies, school for the handicapped, homes for unwed mothers, homes for working girls, homes for the elderly uh, that were also created and or administered by nuns. Bishops vied for these women to get them to serve, come and serve their, their populations in their diocese. American Catholic numbers exploded in the mid to late 19th and early 20th century. And the sisters maintained this incredible network throughout, educating and supporting literally generations of, of, of Catholics here. Although describing Chicago, Sue Ellen Hoy could have been referring to many American cities when she wrote, quote, nuns were among the earliest women to make substantial contributions to Chicago's rise as a modern city, especially in education, health care, and social welfare, unquote. As paramount to their success, I want to focus first on the sisters' ability to adapt to a frequent hostile American milieu with rugged, primitive kinds of conditions at times. I believe the sisters were firmly grounded in their view of themselves as vowed religious women, and then they shaped this identity to their new set of circumstances here. An important component of, and motivation was their understanding of their religious and gender identity within the American context. For Catholic sisters, religion and gender were tightly bound into a single entity. Like many Protestant women, the sisters' training and experience reflected aspects of both traditional gender and religious ideology, embracing ideals of passivity, self-effacement, and self-sacrifice in order to express their natural femininity. 
Scholars in women's history have consistently demonstrated that large numbers of European American and African American women within the Judeo-Christian traditions used religion as a way to justify, define, expand their role in American society. They, they move the boundaries of, of, of many gender parameters in the public sphere. Religious beliefs have been those prime motivators for both. And so I want to do a little bit of, sometimes we don't look at Protestant women and Catholic women in, in a certain way. And I want to do that for just a minute, and then I want to focus on the unique aspects of Catholic sisters. Here's some commonalities here. And again, Protestants being the majority, Catholics the minority, and obviously the, the different religious traditions. Both Protestant women's groups and Catholic sisterhoods created opportunities for lifelong friendships and physical and emotional support networks, providing opportunities for shared experience and collective gender consciousness in school and work settings. Second, Catholic sisterhood and Protestant women's groups created public space for women. This is a very important piece. Justifying their presence in the public domain through gender appropriate activities in charitable endeavors, hospitals, settlement houses, and schools. Third, these public activities helped all church women, Protestant, Catholic, and Jewish for that matter, develop a variety of skills such as leadership, financial and business acumen, outside the family in the home setting. Fourth, through their activities, Catholic sisterhoods and Protestant women provided much needed caregiving functions to society in those three big areas for women, nursing, teaching, and, and social service activities. American nuns were often the first organized group of white women in remote settings in the Trans-Mississippi West. Finally, Catholic women, religious, and Protestant women's organizations expand women's public culture, allowing single women to work and live in a meaningful way in society outside of marriage and motherhood. Besides these positive aspects, both Protestant women and Catholic women also had the downside to, to those issues. Let me share just briefly uh, some of those. They suffered the negative effects of gender in a patriarchal society. Oftentimes, sisters were taken for granted or ghettoized for their work, as were Protestant women. Women's organizations, activities, and finances were sometimes co-opted or dissolved because of male interference. Both Protestant and Catholic sisters had to work within patriarchal and hierarchical structures of church and state. And both had to learn to negotiate power in a social, political, economic, and legal system designed to negate, limit, or control women's leadership, autonomy, power, and influence. Competition breeds success. They used each other to help broaden their own activities, the, the fear, sort of the fear of the other, to gain monies and status within their own religious traditions. The literature is full of examples of, of Catholic sisters utilizing and emphasizing, emphasizing the need to compete with Protestant women as justification for their institution building and activities. Ultimately, this expanded parameters for both. Sisters' institutions gain clerical support in a variety of ways, very, very obvious kinds of ways that, that many of you um, I know are very familiar with. 19th century public school books contained subtle to rabid anti-Catholic images and rhetoric. Um, orphan trains oftentimes took Catholic children from large urban cities to small towns in the Midwest to be adopted and rescued. Um, in the early 20th century, Catholic settlement houses and community centers were created in response to Protestant settlement houses already popular in places like Chicago, Cincinnati, East St. Louis, and New York. Protestants did this too. They knew how to work their system, and Catherine Be Beecher was the, the master. Uh, ironically, she was often called a lady abbess in educational matters. Um, she knew how to work the anti-Catholic rhetoric to get monies for her projects with, with other Protestant women, particularly raising money for the West. She was raising for a female academy in Cincinnati, and she proposed that Protestant women be, quote, given the same social support for their religious and moral activities as Catholic nuns received from their, their society, unquote. Sounding like she could have been quoting from a convent novitiate manual, Beecher emphasized women's need for self-denial and self-sacrifice. However, as not to offend her Protestant listeners, she carefully dif differentiated between Catholics' nun nuns' form of self-sacrifice, describing it as selfish, and aimed at saving themselves by afflictions and, and um, 
personal loss. The superior Protestant women's version of self-denial was not about personal salvation, but as a means to save society. In an interpretation the nuns would have found amusing, Beecher lamented Protestant women's lack of public support in an address to Protestant clergy. She said, quote, had these ladies turned Catholic, talking about her, her Protestant sisters, had these ladies turned Catholic and offered their service to extend that church, they would have instantly found bishops, priests, Jesuits to counsel and sustain them. A strong public sentiment would have been created in their favor and abundant funds would have been laid at their feet. <laughs> Who knew? Even nursing behavior was used. And there's a very interesting editorial during the Civil War. Uh, and a woman lamented in, the, in this newspaper editorial about lack of Protestant women in, in, the, in, the, in the hospitals. Here's what she said. A very nice lady, a member of the Methodist Church, told me that she would go into a hospital if she had a brother in it or a surgeon. I wonder if the Sisters of Charity have brothers, surgeons, in the hospitals where they go. It seems strange that they can do with honor what is wrong for a Christian woman to do. Well, I cannot pity, help but pity those who have false notions of propriety. Let's look at Catholic Sisters in terms of now what, what they specifically, the unique aspects that really helped them survive and, and grow in, this, in, the, in the American milieu. Deeply embedded in their centuries old tradition, there are sort of four qualities that pop out to me. Ethnic and class diversity, lifelong education and work, perpetual vows, and a distinctive environment and tradition. It helped ensure longevity, effectiveness, and growth um, of American Catholic sisterhoods well into the 20th century. For some religious communities, these qualities created an unprecedented female power base that enabled independent activity, limited patriarchal interference and control, and significantly shaped American Catholic culture and public life. Let's talk a little bit about the class and ethnic diversity. European-based communities um, were initially ethnically homogeneous, but that didn't last very long. Most of them began oftentimes as French, Irish, or, or German communities. Many had to Americanize quickly to ensure survival. They had to get recruits here. So they had to let go of things over time, and this varied among communities, of dowries that would not have been overlooked in Europe. They were overlooked here, or something else was substituted for it. Class distinctions within the religious order by the early 20th century were, were, were a thing of the past. American parents were not going to send their daughters into situations that they didn't feel were egalitarian or democratic or to be to be put into a secondary role within a religious order. So what you have in the American milieu essentially is working class, middle class, and upper class women coming together to share community identity and goals. Another reason for minimizing ethnic and class diversity was very simple. It was that anti-Catholic pre prejudice. And in the United States, the public service activities I've talked about for Catholic women, it had a larger symbolic value. During times of epidemics and war, sisters were on the front lines of service, regardless of the religious affiliation of their patients. Sometimes they traveled across the country to assist cities in emergency lockdown from cholera, typhoid fever, yellow fever, and other contagious outbreaks. The yellow fever epidemic in 1878 almost destroyed Memphis. To support nursing sisters working in the city, sister nurses in Kansas City rode 25 hours in the caboose of a freight train to reach Memphis as the passenger trains were barred from the city. During the Civil War, yet again, they worked on hospital ships, established military hospitals. One in five uh, Civil War nurses was a Catholic nun. Sisters were what we now call first responders, um, brought to the battlefield after the fighting stopped as hundreds of soldiers lay dying and corpses covered the ground. They nursed the wounded, wrote letters, gave the last rites, provided spiritual support, and buried the dead on both sides of the struggle. And even, the way, and even away from the battlefield, sisters were smart, particularly in their secondary academies. They would have the young girls who were Protestant, Catholic, and in some cases Jew, Jewish, just a, a, a mix of students. They would make ammunition bags. They would have patriotic programs. This whole thing of American and Catholic fitting together and the fact that you could be Catholic and you could be patriotic. Uh, Protestant women didn't have to worry about um, being an American enough or, or patriotic enough, but sisters had to, and they, they had to train their, their children 
um, in ways to make that point very, very clearly. A second feature characteristic was the sisters' approach to lifelong education and work. In every stage of community life, as a postulant, novice, and professed sister, education played a significant role. And this is both formal education and on-the-job training. So when I speak of education, I'm, I'm crossing terrain here. The spiritual education, um, professional training in some cases, on-the-job training. And in many cases, it was a lifelong endeavor, particularly as qualifications for teaching and nursing began to change and advance. This is a bigger problem in the 20th century because they've got to be able to be licensed and they've got to be able to be certified. Each young sister had mentors who guided her in her work setting. A wide variety of schools, hospitals, and other social service institutions provided ongoing, sometimes very intense, educational experiences. Plus, they had to adapt. They may have started back east, they may be west of the Mississippi, they may be out on the west coast, and each time there was a certain level of, of adaptation. A third unique quality has to do with perpetual vows. Women religious learn to utilize the three vows in this milieu to justify, create, and control space for their public endeavors. I'll give you some examples. The vow of poverty provided the justification for their own hardship and deprivation. It also helped them understand the daily trials and needs of many Catholic and non-Catholic working immigrants. Although elevated spiritually in the eyes of their parishioners, their lack of financial security kept them on an equal par with many immigrants, enabling them to empathize with the people they served. Their own poverty helped them avoid a tendency to patronize the needy, very prevalent in middle or upper class Protestant women orga or organizations. When actually, Gender was the trump card here because all women were going to be paid less as teachers and in other endeavors than men, and Catholic sisters were paid less than, than most white women. And I do make that racial distinction because you, you, there's a hierarchy uh, based on who you are in terms of how pay works. Their vow of obedience to their community and female superior at times offered a buffer to patriarchal authority, permitting them to resist pressure from male clerics who utilized gender and hierarchical privileges to manipulate the sisters at times. It was an effective method whether the demands were small, like, uh, sister, we need, I need somebody from your community to clean my house in the parish, and many communities forbade their sisters in their constitution and rule to, to work in domestic service of this type. Mary, Mary Frances Clark, founder of the BVMs, defended her community prerogatives and refused a local pastor's request to examine convent accounts. It could be that direct in some parishes. Bluntly, but politely, telling him he had overstepped his authority, she said, quote, not even our right reverend bishop required that from me, therefore you will excuse me for positively and finally declining. Lastly, the religious vow of chastity, widely known by Protestants and Catholics alike, afforded the nuns an asexual status. It provided useful moving about the public domain freely. Traveling across the country, creating, administering, working in institutions, kept women religious in close contact and in frequent interaction with all manner of secular men. Um, the sisters, in some ways, had the best of both worlds. Gender afforded them the special courtesy given to most 19th century white women even as their vow of chastity effectively shielded them from most male sexual advances or unwanted attention. Finally, the unique quality of, of having this highly distinctive and inclusive environment that permitted multiple generations to live and work together within woman-only space and tradition. In this communal setting, meals, lodging, celebrations, deaths, privileges, deprivations were shared by all. Some sisters spent 50 or 60 years in a religious community that provided a familial atmosphere where nuns functioned as mothers, teachers, mentors, friends, confidence, and role models of religious life. These intergenerational communities are important for all women during this time period. Um, and it's an important place in women's lives, particularly in lieu of the gender restrictions in many other aspects of their lives. So this intergenerational piece was, was very, very important. It was the alternative to wife and, and, and motherhood, and then for women who would have had very few options then. The last part of my, my first time frame, my first, my first century here of, of discussion, I want to look at the American West 
Besides their apostolic and institution building activities, sisters shared another major narrative that overlaps strongly with the Jesuit story during this first century discussion. No examination of this time period would be complete without a brief discussion of the importance of women religious to the narrative of the American West. Although male religious orders, particularly Jesuits and Franciscans, had been in the Trans-Mississippi West for centuries, the influx of white settlers, especially immigrants, created new opportunities and new demands for service. Both Protestants and Catholics participated in the battle for the minds, hearts, and souls of the multi-ethnic peoples of the Trans-Mississippi West. Scholarship in Western women's history has provided insights into the gendered and multicultural dimensions of life west of the Mississippi. And I think the experiences of 19th century Catholic sisters are critical to understanding the interaction of gender, the intersectionality, sometimes we say, of gender, ethnicity, religion, and class in the American West. In some cases, sisters were the first white women brought in to civilize an area. Male clerics usually preceded the sister, but many of them were itinerant. They simply were needed too many places and had to cross many miles. Um, to serve Catholic parishes and communities. The sisters also came in larger numbers and were important shapers of Catholic, American Catholic culture and public life because they worked with people on a daily basis. You're gonna hear this theme over and over in terms of that, that immediate kind of contact. They administered staff some of the first religious, education, health, social service institutions in isolated frontier settings. And this and, you know, included both Protestants and Catholics. The multi-ethnic diversity of the West, which oftentimes is not talked about, has been proven and discussed by, by most, most modern scholars now in looking at the West, and that's a huge, huge important piece here. Uh, I've, I ran across an interesting thing. It's what we might now call a non-discriminatory policy or a clause in uh, customs books and talking specifically to nurses. What I found was that sisters were required to accept all patients regardless of, religious, of religion or nationality because they were gonna get that diversity. And so the, the sisters were not to, to say, I'm sorry, we're, we're only doing, doing Catholics um, at this point in time. They survived and they thrived the way they did because they always went beyond that in almost all settings particularly in more diverse settings that weren't such large Catholic enclaves. The scarcity of clergy meant that women religious often functioned as surrogate priests at baptism, religious services and ceremonies, and at the deathbed. They trained the children, helped the poor, nursed the sick, buried the dead, and using their religious beliefs, convent training, and vows, the sisters, by their early presence in the American West, were at the forefront of the development and expansion of Catholic culture and public life. And I just want to honor Ann Butler here, who's written a wonderful book called Across God's Frontier. And if you want to, if you read one book about women, uh, Catholic sisters in the American West, I would suggest it. She mined 40 archives. Uh, and she argues that sisters served as conduits in the shaping of institutions and the exchange of cultures, of exchange of culture between indigenous and invading peoples. She also highlights the work of Mother Catherine Drexel, founder of the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament for Indians and Color People, who uh, spent millions of her family fortune to support the Bureau of Catholic Indian Missions. She eventually, her presence was felt here in Chicago in the Black Belt neighborhoods, and, and she also um, established Xavier University in New Orleans. If one analyzes the development of apostolic women's community during this first century, a multifaceted story un unfolds, a truly American narrative. It's a story of immigrants, native born, and the intersection of cultures. Anglo, African American, European, Hispanic, and Native American. It's a story of a religious minority and its growth and survival in a sometimes hostile Protestant milieu. It's a story of the, com the communities of women whose massive institution building of schools, hospitals, and social service combined with their faith and labor-intensive work and helped build and shape American Catholic culture and public life. But finally, it's a story of change and adaptation and how centuries of European religious class and gender traditions clashed with Amer American democratic ideals and eventually realigned within 19th and early 20th century society. 
If power and influence are demonstrated by an ability to act and create, the evidence suggests that American sisters possessed power, influence, and the ability to shape American life. However, unlike white Protestant women who honed their political skills and established a public voice on social issues involving women and children, nuns did not in this time period. Limited as members of a minority religion composed of mostly working class immigrants and by convent manners that emphasized humility, obedience, selflessness, and public silence, nuns demonstrated their influence but rarely gave voice to it. That would change, but it would take another half century for sisters' voices to be heard in the public domain of American life. So as we move to my second part here, we're going to look at the early 20th century and bring it forward. There are different pieces, different things that are part of the story. By the, by the early 20th century, women religious were in some ways victims of their own success and the increasing stability of the American Catholic Church. They were now part of a large, successful church that was moving more into the American mainstream and middle class. In fact, during the first two decades of the 20th century, religious and secular factors coalesced forcing sisters into a more subservient role than they played in the 19th century. And that role really would not change till Vatican II. Um, in 1900-1901, apostolic women's communities were elevated to a higher status in the church, which put them under more direct control. In 1908, the Vatican no longer considered the United States a mission territory, and the entire American church came under more traditional Vatican authority. The 1917 change in canon law sort of completes this, this movement um, and, and sort of solidified this transition to more uniformity, which really hurt the sisters' abilities to do some of the things they had so freely done earlier. This affected diocesan women's communities, but also those with papal approbation. They were forced to standardize their internal organization, impose partial clo cloister, and restrict sisters' travel and their interactions with secular, family, and the outside world. This loss of autonomy limited control over their missions, their flexibility as to religious exercises, and the ability to reelect superiors. Hampered by new regulations, the sisters found their decision-making abilities and autonomy greatly diminished. Innovation, risk-taking, responding to the contemporary needs of people, which were land, landmarks, trademarks of the sisterhoods prior to 1917, were discouraged in favor of rigidity, uniformity, regulation, and following the letter of the law. The vow of obedience became the overriding concern. As part of this process, American bishops also honed their skills in the corporate world and began to centralize ecclesiastical and financial power within their dioceses. Demanding more of the sisters, yet often ignoring the professional aspects of teaching, nursing, and social work, some priests and bishops saw these skills as just natural womanly instincts. They treated the, superior, the, the sisters as unpaid housekeepers of the church. The mavericks and free spirits, and there were many in the first time period, who had helped expand women's communities and sisters' work in the 19th century could no longer leave an unpleasant situation or difficult situation with a superior or a bishop and hope to be accepted in another diocese. There was much more ability to move about if you were in a difficult situation because you were so badly needed. So in some cases, success oftentimes tightens the screws in terms of, of uniformity. Although the sisters maintained their women-only communities, control over the institutions they had created and or staffed had significantly shifted to male hierarchy. The American sisters, who had once been builders and shapers in the world of education, healthcare, and social service, found themselves in a quandary. They needed more formal education, but they lacked the time, support, autonomy, and funding to maintain parity with secular professionalization in the field. Those three areas, those gender appropriate roles for women, teaching, nursing, social service, in the early 20th century, the United States, states, local communities began to set up uh, more stringent requirements and much more specificity, much more professionalization of, of those, um, those particular professions. The proliferation of local, state, national boards and accrediting agencies Secular and Catholic often imposed contradictory demands on the sisters. 
They were further marginalized within the centralization of Catholic boards and agencies that relied on clerical or male spokesmen to interact with secular agencies. So they, they were really getting, getting pushed to the margins in terms of having control over, over, over their own decision making, and in many cases, what their sisters needed to, how their sisters needed to be trained. The parochial schools, the sisters' greatest gift to the church, exploited them in ever larger numbers. At the very time that the educational, social, economic, and political opportunities were expanding for women in the United States, the Catholic sisterhoods were reined in and put under more stringent controls than their 19th century predecessors, far more dissonant than ever before with contemporary gender expectations in American society. So here's our questions. How did sisters transition from that early century of risk-taking, adventure, creative entrepreneurship to that second period that began with tighter restrictions but ends with public activism of the late 20th century? How and when do they acquire public voice and become agents of change and creators of their own story? By the 1920s, we have some under, what I call underpinnings for change beginning. Although it's impossible to create a linear path toward this transformation, the education, work, and lives of Catholic nuns has, had already begun to change, albeit slowly. Although change and resources were minimal in the convents during the 1920s and 30s, change was in the air in Catholic America. Filled with information about social justice teachings, biblical and liturgical movements, Dorothy Day's Catholic worker movement, and Catholic action groups, Adolescents and young Catholics were introduced to a wide variety of teachings and activities embedded with social justice imperatives, which tied their Catholic identity to a larger American identity. After World War II, young women flooded into religious communities, particularly in the, in the 50s. Some, um, some initial groups, entrance classes, were 40, 50 postulants. Um, brimming with World War II optimism and having been given more education as they grew up and independence than earlier generations of American women, these postulants hit the convents at the very time religious communities were beginning to make slow but definitive changes in religious life. By mid-century, orders of women religious had begun a subtle but active transition. Higher education, particularly graduate education, played a major role in that transition and American Jesuits provided a model for creating and promoting higher education. For decades, religious orders of women had created and staffed hundreds of Catholic women's colleges. And also the addition of the Sister Formation Conference, which was begun by Catholic sisters in higher education, would set the stage for the transition that was to come. During the last century, Catholic women's communities in the US founded approximately 200 colleges. By the early 21st century, American sisterhoods had established more than half of the existing Catholic colleges and universities, educating over 250,000 students. Although now most are coeducational, almost all were originally founded to educate young women. Since the early 20th century, women religious who needed expertise to teach in their colleges typically had to go to secular institutions because Catholic male colleges were not open to them or only open potentially on weekends or summers. So they ended up going to very high pro profile institutions in some case, getting graduate degrees, Stanford, USC, University of Chicago, Harvard, and Columbia, among others. They were thrust into a world of academic competition, critical thinking, and research. They excelled in humanities and sciences, but also in the discipline of social sciences. The social sciences, particularly sociology and psychology, were needed for licensing and certification in education, nursing, and social welfare. And the Catholic Church at that point was still rather uncomfortable, particularly with the social sciences, particularly psychology. So women also got education in the secular realm, particularly for a long period of time in these areas. By mid-century, Catholic nuns were some of the best educated women in America, functioning as presidents or CEOs of colleges, large urban hospitals, and numerous social services. Between 1930 and 1960, over 800 women religious received doctoral degrees. Between 1961 and 1990, over 1,600 Catholic sisters earned PhDs. Paradoxically, they were some of the, 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 the best educated and also some of the least educated particularly those who did parish school teaching. 
who were forced into classrooms with huge numbers of children, with very limited training, um, and were just put in a situation, um, so in some cases, um, right out of the postulancy into classrooms without, without training and preparation. Part of this had to do with the fact that in many cases they were needed and it's, you know, women can teach, it's little kids, it's, you know, they can, they can do this stuff. Um, focusing on integrating the goals of, of integration of higher education, professional expertise, and religious life, the Sister Formation Conference began actually 60 years ago. A heavy Midwestern influence in this, which I find interesting when you look at participation and leadership um, the Midwestern nuns were highly representative. Mundelein College and Clark College were important sites for implementing sister formation educational philosophy. And this is where sisters from 15 different communities were educated together. So you begin to see the shift of cross-community, inter-community interaction. Um, the sister formation played this role. Laura Ann Canones and Mary Daniel Turner, in their book, The Transformation of American Catholic Sisters, said, I quote, the Sister Formation Conference was, without question, the single most critical ground for the radical transformation process following Vatican II. So what we have by the late, late 1960s, Jesuit institutions and other Catholic male institutions were beginning to, to open their doors um, for graduate work. Some, it was still very difficult to get a theology degree. Uh, and this, but this would, would also change over time, and that really gave Catholic sisters the linchpin they needed. They had the higher level of education in, in all academic areas and the theological expertise then to create and discuss and, and be a part of what was to come. Lived experience was also extremely important. Sisters during this time period lived among those that they taught whether you're looking at Chicago or other, other areas, you look at those schools, you look at the diversity, you look how long the sisters stayed there as long as they could, and it really impacted how they saw themselves. You take graduate work, sister formation conference supporting them, and this lived experience, you, you're, you're forming some very important uh, building blocks here. Let me give you a quote um, from Sister uh, Maureen Fiedler. She was in Pittsburgh, and she was galvanized by her work as a teacher in an inner city school before and after the assassination of Martin Luther King. She had a PhD from Georgetown, and she said, I experienced a watershed in my life. Quote, I have long reflected on King's life and the work that had come to see the struggle for racial justice as a contemporary version of the gospel movement, movements from slavery to freedom. It was clear the social structures which caused poverty and reinforced racism had to be changed by actions that were systemic or political and thus worldly. Real life issues involving race, ethnicity, and class and the institutional bigotry that maintained the systemic discrimination became powerful teachers, providing catalysts for life-changing ideas and experiences. Places like the Merrillick House, Project Cabrini, here in Chicago, a lot of this, wor this real world experience was, was just um, hugely important to many of the sisters. And certainly the experience in higher ed and real world experience brought many sisters to collaborate with American Jesuits who also valued higher education and a more active public response to social justice issues. In, when Vatican II began in 1962, I don't have to, to probably give you a lot of information on that, but the, all the pieces are coming together here. As a modernization of the church, uh, Sister Mary Luke Tobin represented all American sisters when she was invited as an observer to the council. She later contributed to the forthcoming document, The Church in the Modern World, one of the 16 Vatican II documents. Communities were asked to revisit their founders. And so you have these very highly educated women in all these graduate areas reading things in the, in the original languages, studying theology, and they're taking a whole look at the modern world, in, in, which includes their own personal experiences. Nuns were primed for change. And religious orders of women leaped faster and farther than any group in modern Catholic world to make that transition to the post-Vatican II mindset. Sister Ann Patrick Ware wrote, quote, Sisters brought up in awe of authority and with dedication to obedience studied avidly the documents of Vatican II as if they had been written expressly for them. What you have then, the, the last piece to this, 
is basically what's happening in the larger culture of the United States. The Vietnam War, the war on poverty, the civil rights movement, the women's movement jerked the country out of its 1950s idyllic complacency and shook the nation into re-examining its own ideals and bedrock principles of equality. Women religious, like their Jesuit counterparts, were far from immune from these social struggles and were emboldened by the mandates and optimism of Vatican II as seeing these through the lens of gospel imperatives and significant opportunities to live their Catholic faith in the modern world. So communities began to make changes within their, their own, both, both physical world, if you will, their, their geography, their place, but also in terms of their, their conceptual world, their understanding of themselves and their place in society. Um, the civil rights events of the 1960s were seminal in this. Um, when Sisters of Selma marched in full habits in 19, March of 1965 in Selma, Alabama, it went across the wire services like wildfire. Catholics were pretty divided. You know, some thought it was the greatest thing ever, and others thought, what are they doing? They're, they're embarrassing the whole church and everything in between. The ministries of Catholic sisters exploded into a vast myriad of programs and services focusing on the marginalized of society. Their ministries expanded in every direction. Sister Margaret Traxler, who was then secretary of the National Catholic Conference for Interracial Justice in Chicago, published prophetic words about her Selma experience. She wrote, after Selma, sister, you can't stay home again. She was right. Nothing would ever be the same for American sisters. Interestingly enough, again, I'm going to make a Midwestern connection for you. There is not a, a, a totally accurate count of Catholic sisters who marched in, in March of 1965 in Selma. There were actually four marches, the fine one actually ending up from Selma to Montgomery. Approximately 50 sisters have been identified from 12 different religious orders. 90% were from the Midwest, and 78% were from three cities, Chicago, Kansas City, St. Louis. With mud cake shoes and habits, Sister Mary Ann Summer, a BVM teaching in Kansas City, completed the 40-mile walk from Selma to Montgomery with John Lewis and Martin Luther King by her side. So armed with graduate degrees, real world experience, and the spirit and documents of the Second Vatican Council, many American nuns began an even greater transition into the public sphere. Let me just give you sort of a running tally here and because the, the, it, it would take too long to tell you every single outcome in terms of the, all the areas the sisters went into. Teams of sisters from multi -community, multiple communities worked on issues of discrimination involving race, gender, ethnicity, immigration, disability, gay rights. They moved into the inner cities, the hinterlands. They worked on prison ministry, anti-death penalty advocacy, environmental and peace activism became part of their social justice agenda in the mid to late 20th century. More recently, through global outreach, they have reached out to women and children through microfinancing, fair trade advocacy, water and management issues, ecology, and anti-violence campaigns. This is also a time when you get a lot of sisters coming together across intercongregational lines to create the National Black Sisters Conference, Las Hermanas for, for Hispanic Sisters, National Coalition of American Nuns, and, and many other things. It's also when the LCWR changed their name, um, which did not make the Vatican happy. They had been the, the Congregation of Major Superiors of Women in 1971, they changed it to its current uh, Leadership Conference of Women Religious, which did not please the Vatican because they included women in leadership together in the name. <laughs> it smacked of arrogance, according to the Vatican, and secularism. Um, for the purposes of this paper, let me just share a few more things with you, and then I, then I will bring us to our 200-year uh, uh, whirlwind tour here. Some things you may or may not know. Sister Joelle Reed, graduate of Fordham and later president of Alverno College, was part of the original 28 founding members of the National Organization for Women in 1966. In 1977, many nuns attended the National Women's Conference in Houston, Texas, and subsequent international UN conferences, including the last one in Beijing, China in 1995. In the 1970s, most large women's communities formed social ju uh, justice task forces, and in 1971, 47 Catholic sisters from a variety of communities founded Network, a social justice watchdog group in Washington to lobby both houses of Congress. By the end of the 20th century, 
Over 20 women, women religious communities had NGOs or non-governmental organizations working with UN lobbyists and consultants to work toward a variety of issues including gender equality, women's empowerment, education, health, poverty, environmental sustainability, and global partnerships. In some ways, American sisters have come full circle. At the end of this 200-year marker, their story began as one of survival, growth, risk-taking, and adaptation, entrepreneurship, travel, and adventure, as well as one of poverty, suffering, bigotry, loss, exploitation, and compromise. 200 years later, their story continues as one of survival, risk-taking, entrepreneurship, and global outreach as well as ongoing battles on issues of gender and religious identity, definitions of leadership and power, clerical interference and compromise. The recent Vatican investigation of LCWR is the latest manifestation of one of these battlegrounds. At this moment in time, Catholic sisters live and work on six continents across the globe, continuing to advocate for women and children Yes, the sisters are aging, their communities are getting smaller, and the Vatican, and in some cases, American bishops are making things difficult for independent-minded American nuns and their social justice ministries. But the story I've told you, the sister story is a living legacy, not a dying one. For 200 years, Catholic sisters' contributions in education, healthcare, and social service have been unparalleled in American society. Most importantly, for the last half century, women religious have inspired and empowered and continue to empower many lay men and women who share their work and ideals concerning the promise of justice in American life. The sister's legacy or gift is embedded deeply into the fabric of American society. And ultimately, it may prove to be the most profound and lasting legacy of the American Catholic Church in the 20th century. Thank you. Carol, thank you so much for providing us with the framework to understand the contributions of women religious to the establishment of um, our American culture and our Catholic culture.